I'm in Oysterville, Washington. What happened in Oysterville, Washington to me? Stick around for this video to find out. It includes that young lady right there who's an author doing a book sign. Why don't you come with us? How you doing everybody? My name's Kevin and I live in that van with my two dogs, Barrett and Bella. And we travel this country bringing you footage along the way of the places we see here in the United States on YouTube. And today we are in Oysterville, Washington. There's a peninsula of Long Beach. If you guys wanna Google it, that's where we're at. Right behind me is a very cool cemetery. I talked to a local down here and he gave me some history on the cemetery. So why don't you come with me? Okay, so what a local told me about Oysterville and this cemetery is a very cool story. We have the Espy family and the Clark family. It took me a second to remember it. Who in the 1860s, I believe, or 1600s is when this town was kind of created, but it was mainly started in 1850. And that was by the Espies and the Clarks. And their, their family is buried here in this cemetery. And he also told me that when I go into Oysterville, there is a lot of history in there and old buildings. And even the families, the great, great, great granddaughters live there in town. So we're going to take a tour around this cemetery, show you some cool gravestones, maybe find some epic history. And then we're going to go into town to Oysterville, which is that way, and see what's in that town. But for now, let's check out this cemetery. This is very cool. We have a lot of people still laying things like coins, oyster shells, magnets, candles for Chief Nakati, 1826 to 1864, 38 years Chief Nakati lived. Oh, very cool. We have a lighter, a dream catcher, and it looks like an old cigar. So I bet there's a legend or something known, maybe I should do some research of Chief Nakati and he likes cigars. Richard Morris, 57 years old, can't read a date on it. Can't read that one either, but I did walk by this one earlier and this is a very cool sign. It says, and the sea gave up the dead, Revelations 2013, unknown to sailors. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. People still leaving coins and memorabilia and flowers. So what the gentleman told me about this cemetery, and I think he was down here doing some, uh, some work on the grounds, he had said that this side up here is the historic side, and this side was donated by the families, the Espies and the Clarks, for grave sites for times of now. So just to give you kind of an idea, this is the area, I saw him down here, this is kind of the area where there is more modern grave sites, and this is the old area, and this is the new area. And as we could see, 1903 is the death date on that. 1849, Emma Anderson to 1931. So you could see that the, the dates probably get more modern the closer we get to this way. But this gravestone is one that I wanted to see because it's very interesting looking. And it's almost unlegible. Nancy died September 9th, 1898, aged Oh, I can't read that. 61 years, nine months, two days is what that says. Sweet, beloved. I can't read the rest of it. I can't, but that's a very, very interesting gravestone. Olive. So this is multiple sites here. Olive died in 1896, aged 22 years, three months, 26 days. Henry. This has got all of them on each side. Henry died in 1896, aged 22 years, seven months, 14 days so that was probably something that happened to both of them that caused them their demise very interesting another cool gravestone here with a with an anchor on it so i'm imagining that that's a sailor sacred the memory of goh johnson died in 1881 aged 56 years it's very cool to see in this graveyard here which is different from the east coast these headstones are actually telling how many years these people lived for. Very cool, let's look some more. This one is behind a bush, kinda hidden away. Born 1879, died 1882. This is Caroline, only child of Reverend E.B. Davis. Can't read the rest of it, but only alive for three years. Probably died of some kind of illness. 
I don't know. There's no backstory for me to check. Okay, so let's try to find the Espies and the Clarks uh, gravestones. That says Stevens. Can't read that one. So we're looking for Espies and the Clarks, and I'm imagining that they're probably up here in this area. But I want to see what's on the other side of this headstone. 1844 to 1888, Helen Wirt. I believe we found the Espies. We did. Huge plot for the Espies. I mean, we've all of these are Espies. All of them. So we'll start from this side. 1908 to 1999, 1899 to 1955, 1883 to 1977, and 1887 to 1969. This is a gigantic family plot. Robert Espy, 1826 to 1918, 1821 death, 1923. And we have 1918 passing away, 1911, 1925, 1926, or 1906. That's Robert Hamilton Edwin Espy. I can read that one. And these are probably family members, Pearsons, of them because they're buried with them. 1990 passed away, 2013. So these are newer sites of probably relatives of the Espies. And we have 1932, 1905, and 1916. Those are the deaths there. 1852 to 1983, or I'm sorry, 1952 to 1983. So you can see that this town has a lot of history with families. The Espies, let's count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 23 family members of the Espies are buried right here. Let's see what this one's all about. Sylvester P. German died in 1888, aged 37 years, 8 months, 19 days. Here is the Clark plot. So is the Espies and the Clark. I'm seeing Bowens around and Slingerland, Bird C. Sling Slingerland, who was a PFC in U.S. Army in World War II and died in 1958. So here we go. Isaac Clark, born in 1828, died in 1906. And that says, founder of Oysterville in 1854. Isaac and Sarah Clark died in eight, nine, 1866. And you can see how they're all buried together. Thomas Warman, Captain A. Stream, and a bunch of family members, 1916, 1928, 1927, 1870, our baby born and died on, in 1870. That's what that says. So we found them. We found the Clarks and we found the Espies over there. Very cool uh, grave site we saw over there of Chief Nakati and right over there of the two unknown sailors. So now let's head into town to Oysterville and see if we could find some historical markers there like the gentleman told me about them having still ties to that town, the family, the Espies, and the Clarks. And he had said the historic buildings have plaques on them, so we can see. I'm not sure if we can go up, but we're going to find out together. Why don't you come with me? How you doing, everybody? As you can see, I'm in a house. Why am I in a house? Well, because the town of Oysterville is very, very friendly. And I went and talked to a grandson of one of the clerks of the Espies. I can't remember. They live in a red house down the street. My cousin, David. His cut, her. He's a, he's a great, grand, great, great grandson. Okay, so he's a great, great grandson of the Espies. His name is David. And he told me to come down this way. And his mom would call me later, maybe for an interview. But I walked down the street. And I talked to many, many people, and one of the people told me to see that young lady standing right there. She is the historian of the town, and she's also an author, and you have a book signing today, I believe. So I'm going to introduce you to Sydney, uh, sitting over here to my right. And what better score for me as a historian to happen upon a town like Oysterville? And I've already talked about the brief history of it, and I could be way wrong or I could be way right. But we're going to talk to Sydney right now, and she's going to give us a little bit of a backstory here, and then we're going to, I'm going to show you guys how beautiful this village is. What I want to talk to you about is, uh, first of all, I'm, I think it was probably my cousin David that you 
Matt, how, how old a guy was he? He was a teenager, probably. Oh, a teenager. Yeah, he was just walking down the street oh, doing some exercise. Oh, okay, and, but he's an Espy descendant. Well, it, because my great-grandfather, R.H. Espy, Robert Hamilton Espy, founded Oysterville. And, um, that was in 1858, I think? 1854. 54, okay. And uh, with a, a friend, I.A. Clark, Isaac Alonzo Clark. And uh, the Clarks moved from Oysterville early on. Um, Espy and Clark were very much alike. They were uh, young men in their 20s. Um, they were here from Pennsylvania, and uh, they were looking for adventure. And uh, <clears throat> they, had, they had come across the Oregon Trail, not together. They met out here. And they both liked uh, to play poker. They mm -hmm. both liked a little tot of whiskey. And uh, uh, they were single and, uh, as I say, looking for adventure. The only difference uh, between them was Espy was a staunch Baptist and Clark was a staunch Methodist. And so the story goes, uh, before my time, you understand, but the story <laughs> goes that uh, they, were the, they were the first uh, uh, white men in this part of the bay and uh, unlike uh, across the bay, there was a, a small settlement, and th those men were not interested in more settlers. They wanted the oyster treasure in the bay to themselves. But Espy and Clark were very, um, uh, I wouldn't say generous, but they were uh, open to having more people come and settle. And uh, as the town boomed, uh, it became pretty boisterous. Uh, apparently that didn't bother the Baptists, I don't know why, but it bothered the Meth yeah. Methodists. And so Clark and his family uh, moved away, uh, I, I don't know, within 20 or 30 years. But the Espies have been here ever since. And yeah, we and uh, we're not so boisterous anymore. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it's interesting to me that, um, you know, that you found Oysterville. Uh, lots of people do find it, and but that you have pursued, and you know, it's called to you. I think in yes. some way. Yes. And um, I, I, I'm a writer. Uh, my interest is in history, uh, and I, I also was a teacher for 39 years. And so, um, since I retired, uh, I've been doing more writing, all about the history of this area. It's not making me a ton of money because uh, it's a tiny area and uh, uh, not that m many people probably are interested in the history. But uh, the other thing that uh, is a bit of interest to me, but of great interest to many people, are ghosts. And this Ooh, area... They've been has, asking for some ghosts. <laughs> this area has a lot of ghosts. And uh, uh, I have to say, I don't... I don't know if I really believe in ghosts or not, but we have uh, a resident ghost in this house. What I was interested in about Mrs. Crouch is her name. Mrs. Crouch was a real person. She did live in this house uh, when my great-grandfather built the church across the street, the Baptist church. He purchased this house, which had been built in 1869, and this was in 1892. He purchased this house to be the parsonage for the church. And it served in that capacity for 10 years. Oh, wow. And the first preacher here was Josiah Crouch. And he came with his wife, uh, who was somewhat younger, uh, and a young baby, his mother, and a teenage brother. I think uh, Crouch was probably in his late 20s. His wife was barely 20. And um, he had to go on a church call up the Willapa River, across the bay and up the Willapa River, in the summer after he came. He'd been here, he came in November and in July he went on a church call and he took his wife and baby with him. And uh, something happened and their sailboat turned over and he was able to save the baby, but That's not right his wife. There was a lot of talk about it. He apparently was a bit of a womanizer, this Mr. Crouch. And uh, so, um, there was so much consternation. She was, she, they did rake the river and they found her, and the women who laid her out reported to the sheriff that they were curious about the marks on her. Oh, so this yeah. could have been foul play. And uh, so the body was exhumed. 
and they could not tell whether it was the marks from the rake or if it was finger marks. Yeah. And so they uh, reburied her across there. She's not in the Oysterville Cemetery. She's in the Menlo Cemetery. And um, uh, but the the matter stayed open. He Crouch came back to Oysterville, continued preaching. And he stayed until uh, fall. And um, then uh, there was continuing interest in this case, and a warrant was put out for his arrest. And he left, uh, I don't know under what circumstances, but before that warrant could be served, and apparently took the baby with him. Okay, now back to ghost stories. So, <laughs> Mrs. Crouch is presumably the the ghost in this house and actually there have been some strange circumstances you have to buy my book to find out what they are I but, will link <laughs> her book in the description of this video I'll have the name of her book or a web is there a website to be able to purchase it uh yeah and, okay uh, so it, that'll be there for you guys at the end of this in I, the I description can tell you about it. okay so actually there are two books now so uh, I've written about uh, mrs. crouch there have been play I've, I've been involved in a play with about Mrs. Crouch. There's a ballad that Very a nice. singer-songwriter in Seattle wrote about Mr. Uh, Mr. Crouch was not a righteous man. Yeah. I love the ballad. Anyway, um, so uh, so you know, I I decided I would write a story about Mrs. Crouch, and in in researching her and the history of um, you know the church and blah blah blah. Uh, that satisfied my historical itch, but I began to to learn about other ghosts, and some some I could key to real people, uh, some I couldn't. So I, I wrote a book. And, I'm going to be reading this book. <laughs> and so the book was relatively popular, but again, this is a small area, right? And uh, uh, so that book was published in 2014. Um, Time went by. I have a cousin, an, an SB cousin, who lives in uh, Virginia, and uh, he's kind of the genealogist of the family. And he was very interested in this Reverend Josiah, the unrighteous Reverend uh, Josiah Crouch, and so he has been pursuing that, and it, it was timely because right at the time that uh, Ralph was looking for more information on ancestry, any place he could look. Um, the state of California and probably other government agencies were um, releasing a lot of their documents mm -hmm. and lo and behold Josiah Crouch turns up in uh, mugshots from San Quentin in 1897. So he was arrested. He was but not for this and if you want to find out for what you'll have to read my second book. <laughs> so so all, She's of, smart. <laughs> all of this is to say that it happens that today I am going um, down to Long Beach to an art gallery um, that also carries both of my the, both of those books and some other books that I've written too. And I'm doing a book talk and um, and hopefully selling books for the gallery. But uh, but as I was thinking about what I was going to say. I wanted to talk about thin places. Do you know anything about thin places? I never even heard that term. Uh-huh. Okay. I hadn't either until about 25 years ago, I think. And uh, we do summer Vesper services in the, in the um, church. And we uh, ask various ministers from a variety of denominations to come. The church is no longer Baptist. It's uh, uh, interdenominational. And uh, several different ministers, particularly ministers who had done uh, service in, um, in Ireland, mm -hmm. said they felt that Oysterville was a thin place. What's a thin place? Well, apparently the Irish, and it's an old Celtic idea, uh, but it, uh, it's worldwide as well, believe that there are special places in the world where the veil or the wall but they say the veil between this world and the other world is thin 
I don't you think they drank too much whiskey when they were telling this story, William? We don't know. We don't know. But well, the other thing, and I was just looking up online about thin places, and another thing that I didn't know that I thought was interesting is that the Irish also believe that um, in graveyards, oh, I'm, I'm probably going to get this screwed up. In graveyards, the... the um, there's three feet between there's three feet between this world and heaven, okay. but in thin places, there it's much less than three feet. So we're probably talking inches. Well, maybe, or maybe yeah. you can step back and forth, maybe. And so my interest in this is why do we have so much ghost activity? Not just in Oysterville, but in this area. And why do people come to Oysterville and say? There's something about this area. They don't say ghosts. They say the light is different. They, I mean, constantly this happens. And so... That's very interesting. kind of gave me chills a little bit to kind of think <laughs> about that because now my perception when I came into this town was I was chasing history. So I was looking for people to talk to. I wasn't really... I was looking at, at it through the camera lens. Okay, I want to I want to film this house on the outside. I want to film this street sign because you have a very historical street sign sitting out here by the, yeah, by the right. school. And I really didn't feel the town because I was concentrating on work. And now that you've said that, yes. you've taught me something that, I, that I've known before that yeah. you just brought me back to, which is look outside the lens, take the lens away, and feel. Well, you know, when, and you, when you were talking about being on the service road in the forest area yeah. and the cloud coming through and you could hear it. Mm -hmm. That's the I feeling mean, you're isn't that, isn't, I mean, I don't know if it's exactly the same feeling, but there are times when, uh, you know, I don't even think you have to be alone, but there are times when you're someplace and something happens that's different. You can't quite describe it. And mm -hmm. I, you know, it, I just think it's interesting. And I, and I thought, well, maybe for this ghost talk, Today, maybe I'll talk about thin places a little bit, but maybe I've already talked about them. I'll go no, I'll that, move on. <laughs> I, I, the best part about this inter this interview that I'm doing with you is it was so spontaneous and it was just a happenstance. It was right now. You could have talked about why your color of your carpet is this this color, <laughs> and I would have been completely interested and fall fell in love with the story. Um, you give me so much more, and I do appreciate it. Now, with closing this video, um, I know what my viewers are thinking right now, and I'm going to ask them for you. Have you seen the ghost here in this house? Have you have any in, any occurrences that you wouldn't mind giving us a little taste? Because it's probably in the book. Uh, in the first book, for sure. Um, I I say often, and I I've said in both books, I think that I don't really believe in ghosts. But having said that, yes, I have had experiences with Mrs. Crouch. And I think it's Mrs. Crouch. I don't know. I'm, I'm saying it's Mrs. Crouch because yeah. I don't know what else would explain right. it. But, and, and it's interesting that in the very first time I, uh, you know, I was a summer kid here. My grandparents lived in this house. And then my parents retired here. And, um, and then now my husband and I live here. Um, and the, the first time that I learned anything about Mrs. Crouch was actually as an adult, not when I was a kid, uh, from my mother and um, my folks had were on a trip or something and I was still living in California and I came uh, I came here home I always think of this as home and um, I got I arrived late, late at night put my uh, I, I was doing a writing project so I left my typewriter down here I uh, <laughs> uh, went upstairs and went to bed and uh, was just falling asleep and I hear this um, kind of a tap 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 noise and I'm wide awake and I couldn't I couldn't figure out where it was coming from and uh, tap 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 so I turned the light on nothing uh, turn the light off almost asleep tap 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 this continues and my dad had said there were squirrels in the they were, having, they were having squirrel problems in the gutters. Yeah. Didn't t I thought that would be scritchy scratchy, not not tap tap tap. So I didn't think it was a squirrel. So finally, uh, I turned. I determined that it was in the little room next door, and I turned on uh, the light, went in there, 
And there, beside the bed in that little room, was a typewriter of a kind that I have never seen before. And actually, um, and and uh, and I I thought, huh, somebody's trying to type, and uh, went back to bed. And then then I, now I had solved the problem, so I went to sleep, no problem. And later, uh, when my folks got back, uh, I asked mom, uh, you know, where that typewriter came from. I, I've been in this house all my life. I've never seen it. And she said that uh, my aunt had uh, found it in the attic or someplace and had lent it to the Historical Society. And they had called and asked mom if she wanted it back or wanted to make it a permanent uh, donation. And she said, well, we'd like it back. Okay. So, um, so obviously, people tell me, uh, someone was trying to type something. Why didn't you put paper in the no, typewriter, yeah. you know? But uh, I wouldn't have known how because it was such a different typewriter. And when I looked up, uh, I, I looked up the patent number, and I can't remember exactly, but it was in the early 1900s after... Uh, Sarah Crouch had been killed, mm. which probably doesn't mean much. I mean, she could have tried to type on any typewriter. Mm. I don't know. So, but I've had Maybe that an one, iPad. and uh, so that that was that was a very uh, visceral experience. And uh, and when my mother told me about Mrs. Crouch, um, I thought, well, maybe, maybe, maybe. But I've never seen her. Other people have. No one's ever seen her. But other people have had strange experiences with her when I've been in the house, okay. and so that's in the book, yeah. <laughs> probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Sydney, I uh, I can't thank you enough for um, this has been one of my favorite moments as a uh, traveler, as a nomad traveling this country um, that I that I'll remember for the rest of my life, and I know you and I are going to talk again um, at some point. Uh, and I appreciate your hospitality and allowing me into your beautiful house here to be able to sit down with a complete stranger like me um, and just have a awesome 20 minute conversation. Well, good. Maybe so, it'll sell some books. <laughs> yeah, I will. I, I'm going to actually pick up both those books and maybe I'll purchase some more if she has them in stock and we'll do an auction on my channel. Whoa. And, uh, <laughs> and we'll, we'll auction those books off and then I'll put in the description for the people that want to get into an outside auction for the purchase of these books. I'll put the, de the description, I'll put the link in the description below for you guys to be able to click on to, to purchase these books. Um, I'm gonna go outside here and film this town for you guys as an, as, a, as an outro. I really appreciate you being here for this awesome conversation with Mrs. Espy. And no, Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. But, Stevens, but, but, but a descendant of, of the uh, SBs, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, you guys know how I get names wrong all the time on this channel. <laughs> it's okay. So I appreciate you guys being here for this. Come join me outside for a view of this town, and I am sure there's going to be more videos of Oysterville here on the Nomak Experience. So with that, guys, I hope you enjoy the rest of this town and the music that's to follow, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, Kevin. Oh, thank you. So here we are outside, very interesting part of my day so far, I can't complain at all. I want to show you guys this sign and show you down these roads here and then I'm going to film with, and I already have Cindy's permission, the outside of her house and her property area and then I was told to walk down Clay Street, go to the bay and walk towards a cannery. So I'm going to include you guys in on that. Why don't you come with me? So here is the old sign that really had me uh, wanting to film here. As you can see, this sign has a lot of history to it. We got school street, schoolhouse, and parking. There's the schoolhouse right over there, and I'll tell you all about that. This, I, I'm actually boondocking in this guy's driveway tonight. Very nice gentleman. His family has been living here for a very, very long time in this area. They just moved to Portland to this house to take it over. And he told me that whole story. I am very lucky to have met these people because he introduced me to Sydney. But that's where I'm going to be boondocking. And I'll film that house when I walk back to the van. But as for now, let's go check out Sydney's house here in Oysterville, Washington. <laughs>
Now I'm gonna take you guys for a tour of Sydney's house and the surrounding area and then go down Clay Street. But let me give you a little bit of in, uh, information here. I have permission to walk onto her property. These are private properties. When you guys visit towns, please do the thing that I try to thrive on, which is show the locals and the homeowners of places like this and historic villages and towns across America, show them the respect and always get permission first before you go film. Right across the street, is the historic Oysterville Church. And if you guys remember the story that Sydney told us about the ghost she has in her house, that's the church across the street. So I know I talked about an outro earlier, but there's so much to film here and this may be a long video. I'm gonna continue on this video going into her property, showing you, oh, there's a very interesting thing about this, this, uh, this area here too. And the time is, a long time ago, back in the 1700s, 1800s, when they built houses on bays, the front of the house always faced the bay. This is actually the back of the house. So any house that you see where the door is facing the street, that's a newer house. All the older houses, the front door faces the bay. So why don't you come with me? So right over there is Sydney's house. That's the front door. I'm gonna flip the camera on here and show you guys in a minute. That's the bay. So if that's the bay, how cool is that? That's the front of Sydney's house. It faces the bay. You couldn't have a better front porch in the United States of America than that front porch right there, overlooking the bay here in Oyster Bay. Now, when I walked into her front yard, I noticed that there's an old cannon sitting here in her in her property. So let's go film that cannon. It looks like there is a sign or a placard on the front of this cannon display here. So I'm going to walk around to the front of this cannon and show you guys if it says something. I don't know because I haven't seen it yet. Let's take a look. There is. The Honorary Oysterville Militia was formed in 2003 for the express purpose of acquiring a cannon for which to celebrate the village's sesquicentennial in 2004. Founding members are listed below. And as you can see, there is a lot of them. That would make for one extremely boring part of this clip if I were to read seriously a hundred different names, so I'm not gonna do that. You guys can pause the video there and take a look at the names there. But uh, absolutely gorgeous house. Absolutely gorgeous house, absolutely gorgeous property. Take a look from where I'm standing. Okay, so I'm gonna go on the other side of this house, which is Clay Street. I'm gonna walk down to the bay, which was suggested by a new friend of mine here in town, and I'm gonna walk towards the cannery. And Sydney, thank you if you're watching this. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for allowing me to come onto your property and film this beautiful, scenery that you have to see every single day. You are one lucky person and your family history to me um, by you telling me that story just really, really made this trip out to Washington worth it for me. So thank you very much. And I appreciate all that you have done for me information wise, Sydney. Thank you.
So I'm standing out here and I can't go any further because that's the bay. I hope you guys got a good shot about how far low tide goes out because there is four or 500 yards of absolute marsh until you get to deep waters. So seeing these sailboats out here tells me the water comes all the way up here. You have to get into the water at that time and you gotta be back before low tide goes out. So we're gonna walk back up and we're gonna film a little bit more of this town. This is gonna be a long video and I'm not apologizing for that because I know some of you guys are gonna stick around to watch all of it and some of you may come back to watch the rest of it. I completely understand. But So let's go into town here and film some spots and some houses of historic value. Let's go. There are my very, very poor piano skills for you guys. That's pretty much all I got. I could play Home Sweet Home from Warrant. Now let's try that out real quick. Yeah, that's pretty much all I got, but let's stand up front here at the uh, parish table and look out. This is a great old historic building. Look at these doors, they're huge. Looks like a congregating area here with another organ. And this is the other exit door, but we're gonna walk around and go back out the exit and show you that, that sign. Historic Oysterville, founded in 1854. This might be a spot where you guys want to pause the camera to kind of get a gist of where everything is located. And I'll move the camera up here in a few seconds and we'll look at this sign here. So registered National Historic Place Oysterville under the provisions of the National Historic Preservation Act of October 16, 1966. This property possesses ex exceptional value in commemorating or illustrating American history placed on the National Register on April 21st, 1976 by the National Park Service, U.S. Department of the Interior, Washington State Parks and Recreation Commission. Wow, what an awesome town. Okay guys, for right now, I'm gonna end this video. Thank you so much for coming with me on this awesome adventure. I just went in this house and interviewed an amazing person, Sydney. I just happened on Oysterville. I just drove up this road, walked down that road to the bay. What a day, what an amazing day this has become. I'm standing with my back to the wind because it got kind of windy. I'm not sure how that's gonna come out in editing, but we're gonna finish this video for right now, guys. There may be a part two to this, I don't know, because I'm gonna spend the rest of this day kind of discovering this old town and maybe to talk to some other people. I need to head back into Long Beach to buy a couple books at the book signing today in Long Beach for Sydney's books. And then I'm gonna meet up with her later and we're gonna discuss maybe doing an auction for more books for you guys to be able to purchase. So thank you for coming with me here in the Nomak Experience, visiting Oysterville. I hope you appreciate as much as I do the history of this town and the people in it. Thank you guys for being here and we'll see you on the next one.
the curtains Brew some herbal tea Reach out for me Take my hand and lead even when I'm